now more than ever, it is important for us uh, to be mindful about our health and uh, how to improve our immune systems. The situation we find ourselves in now is going to be with us for some period of time. And we know that those people who suffer the most are those people with um, comorbidity factors, uh, overweight, um, breathing problems, uh, so many autoimmune problems. And these are all reversible. Diabetes is reversible. And uh, so part of the things that we're going to be talking about is uh, how we can keep ourselves healthy uh, following the Asian uh, system of medicine that uh, is very powerful and effective and uh, gives us uh, great wisdom and enlightened ways of living. Most of us believe that we are now at the epitome of human accomplishment and achievement. However, as we look at past cultures over thousands of years of history, there is an astounding evidence of uh, the, that the, our forefathers possessed great wisdom. And uh, as I say, were very effective in uh, developing medicines, uh, herbal medicines, foods, behaviors, that's what I mean by enlightened uh, ways of living. In fact, um, the father of uh, agriculture in China, Emperor Shen Nong, is considered the father of agriculture in China, lived in 2700 BCE. That's a long time ago. And he, is, uh, he taught people how to identify edible plants, how to cultivate them, he is said to be responsible for inventing the plow and the axe and digging wells and irrigation and the preservation and storage of seeds and was also instrumental in uh, acupuncture and pulse taking, one of the four diagnostic methods uh, used by physicians in making a proper diagnosis in cultivating um, artemisia, which is used uh, uh, as moxibustion a heat, either as a cone or on a needle, to deliver heat deep into the body, directly or indirectly on the acupoints to stimulate the flow of qi and blood, and adding uh, refinement, you know, to the, our herbal uh, pharmacopoeia. That was 2700 BCE. He was also uh, supposedly responsible for the cultivation of tea which was also used uh, as a, uh, an herb. But at any rate, the, uh, the things we're going to be going over are always um, to enhance our health, our well-being, and our happiness. I call this the golden eight pebble lotus of Asian medicine. Can anyone um, remember those eight eight branches or eight petals that I mentioned last time. We're going to be going over them in detail. And you may want to take notes uh, for these, uh, these sessions. But the sages of the past started with meditation. The idea was awakening. That is the seed of health and happiness, to tame the mind. And there's a lineage that goes with all of these. You know, we, we spoke about lineage in the uh, uh, last text uh, that we uh, read in the Mahmoud lineage prayer. And uh, we are still continuing that on our Monday night uh, sessions with Naropa's uh, study, Naropa's wisdom. But each of these that we're going to talk about, there's a lineage associated with them. And from uh, teacher to student, uh, this uh, wisdom was passed down in an unbroken uh, fashion from teacher to student. And this has come to us uh, today, right down through the ages. So this uh, system, this uh, series of teachings, uh, is derived from these traditions of the uh, 
eight branches of Chinese medicine that are actually uh, found in the medical texts. I, I think I mentioned that last time, but the first recorded medical text of uh, Huangdi Nijing. This was a dialogue between the Yellow Emperor Huangdi, who lived uh, uh, around 2700 uh, to 2597 uh, BCE. So we have about 5,000 years of uh, traditional medicine. This was a dialogue between the Yellow Emperor, Guangdi, and his physician, Shipo. So much of uh, what I'm talking about as far as this uh, eight branches, the first one being meditation, the second being uh, Qigong or Tai Chi, a way to keep ourselves healthy. We were saying uh, last week that the primary source of energy is the air that we breathe. We can go for a while without eating and drinking. We can't go long without breathing. So cultivating the qi, the vital life force, prana, um, qi, these are all uh, words for the same thing, which is this vital life force that animates us and keeps us healthy. And when it's blocked or stagnant, we uh, are sick. So we want to keep the qi uh, strong and healthy, to move the blood, to get the oxygen uh, to the sites uh, that we need to nourish uh, every cell of the body. So Qigong and Tai Chi are ways to uh, do that, our exercise, basically. And so you can do walking, you can do a variety of things, but the ancients taught Qigong, and we are going to uh, talk about Qigong as well. That is the second of the eight. The third is um, diet and nutrition, just to emphasize or reiterate what, uh, what we're going to be doing over these next uh, weeks and probably months, uh, a diet and nutrition. So the old saying about uh, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food is uh, still true that uh, what we eat we become to a certain degree. And unfortunately, our uh, diets are sorely lacking in real nutrition. And uh, we will talk about diet and nutrition. The fourth is massage or twina. Twina is a type of uh, Asian massage. The fifth is the I Ching or Mo. Mo is the Tibetan I Ching, a prognosticating or way of uh, divination, which is considered very important. And the Bodhisattva's attitude is that uh, uh, we want to work for the benefit of beings and having insight in the problems that human beings uh, experience. Uh, this is uh, considered a vehicle for prognostication, both the I Ching and Mo. Mo in particular with the energy of uh, the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, Mantushri, and his uh, mantra, Omara Patsanadi. So we will talk about those aspects as well how we can use the I Ching and Mo um, when we're in a quandary and we need to uh, quiet the mind, our worries, uh, to get a vision of how best to approach a situation for ourselves and for others. The sixth is Feng Shui, which is uh, the lay of the land. So in building a house, in building uh, a monastery, the environment was uh, closely monitored and uh, considered uh, where the mountains, where the streams, where the uh, flatlands were, and all the things that uh, go into uh, a positive energetic environment. And you can tell if a, an environment is uh, positive. Uh, if you go into the country and you uh, look at the, the cattle there. Are they healthy? Are they strong? Are they um, uh, healthy looking? You can tell um, just by looking and the animals and the birds and what's there. And in your own house, does it make you happy? Those things that uh, make you happy, it's generally good feng shui. You don't want to be confined. You don't want to have things that create uh, negative uh, thoughts in your mind. So we will talk about uh, feng shui uh, 
uh, both our personal feng shui and the feng shui of our environment, our house. Um, it was always considered when looking at a patient, what is their living situation? Where do they live? What is the sense of their, uh, their water, eating, uh, climate? All these kinds of things because that influences health. Too much heat, too much cold, too much wind, uh, too much dampness. All these things are important uh, uh, to avoiding illness and to cultivating health. The seventh of the eighth is herbal medicine, uh, knowing what herbs are useful in certain situations. We will talk about uh, those things and we'll also include some essential oils as well uh, that can be used in a healing way. And the last of the uh, eight branches or eight petals is acupuncture, acupressure. That is seen as the last uh, source or resort. Uh, when we have uh, failed in our meditation, in our qigong, in our diet, in uh, massage, in uh, cultivating the wisdom of uh, our environment and herbs, then we resort to what was considered like a surgical procedure, which is acupuncture, to really command the energy of the body through the meridians and the acupoints. So these are the things we're going to be looking at. Does anyone have any questions about that so far? So, um, as I mentioned, um, the Buddha said that uh, the, the path is uh, like entering a, a dark room with a bright light in the hand. So the darkness will be cleared away and the room will be filled with light. So wisdom is like that. The Dharma is like that. The Noble Eightfold Path is like that. Uh, it is a bright light that removes the darkness and shows us uh, the way. And this um, system is similar. It uh, is a light to show us how to uh, engage in healthy behaviors and how to really attain uh, a good uh, health and well-being. So that's what we're going to present here, these healing traditions. So as with anything else, uh, we're looking for a qualified and respected teacher. I've had the good fortune of studying with uh, many wonderful teachers uh, in each of these areas. So um, I will be presenting these, uh, this these different uh, lineages um, as sources of teaching that has come down through the ages. But from a Buddhist point of view, and uh, we're going to start with meditation, the first of these, and some of you may be new uh, to uh, Buddhism. Uh, I know many of you are not, as I look at the, uh, the names. Um, you have been part of our uh, Sangha or our membership for some time, and uh, we've been uh, studying Buddhism uh, for many years together. But uh, What's presented here is the Buddhist approach from the Kagyu lineage of Tibetan Buddhism, one of the four major lineages of Tibetan Buddhism. There are other lineages, uh, Chan of China and uh, the Japanese lineages, the um, Southeast Asian uh, traditions. But what we're talking about here are the uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhists originated with the uh, historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, who lived over 2,500 years ago. And the teachings of the Buddha can be summarized, uh, as we've said before, in three aspirations. Cultivate excellent virtue in abundance, avoid wrongdoing and harmful actions, and completely tame your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. These may be simple as we, we to say, but as we know, hard to follow. So there are many ways uh, to practice these. The Buddha taught, it is said, 84,000 different ways to appeal to all the different minds uh, that uh, people have. 
But given those uh, three aspirations, one does not have to be Buddhist to see the wisdom in following these tenets, leading ultimately uh, to peace of mind. And I think most of us, uh, if we were to say what matters most of us or what do we uh, want, we want peace of mind, free from our habitual patterns, cravings, uh, misconceptions and the like. So all the traditions, uh, religions, include some form of meditation, contemplative prayer, or simply communing with nature as a vehicle uh, to achieve awakening and to realize our basic goodness, what we would call our Buddha nature. Uh, so in terms of our uh, lineage, I, you know that I have completed the, the three-year, three-month uh, retreat that was in 2000 to 2004 under the auspices of uh, my teacher, the renowned meditation master, Kemal Kartra Rinpoche. And uh, people ask me about my experience in retreat, which is the hallmark of the Karmakaja uh, of lineage. And this was both very profound and arduous uh, for me and for everyone who's undertaken this task. Many obstacles uh, come up uh, during this time that significantly uh, challenge the practitioner. This is not at all usual. Many have uh, undergone this rigorous training and experience, the upsurge of physical, mental, emotional, spiritual challenges to bubble up from the depths of our being. This is uh, very common. And what you learn is that if you resist this, uh, it, is, uh, it can be become very painful. So we're uh, taught to allow this, to just see it and uh, to work with it, we bring everything to the path. I think you know I'm a, a trucker, particularly uh, next generation. I'm secretly the captain of the starship. Um, that's my aspiration in another existence. So um, you may be familiar with the board statement, resistance is futile. Uh, so this is appropriate here. The more you resist, the more painful um, the experience becomes. So these are all seen as part of a purification process. And for all of us, whether you're in a retreat or not, letting go of old structures and beliefs are not easy and are often accompanied by some degree of suffering. But the more resistance, the more suffering. So we embrace uh, these changes, see it as opportunity, and uh, we'll address this more when we talk about the Buddhist uh, teaching on the Four Noble Truths. But the good news is we can change. Uh, and as we progress along the path, we can begin to see uh, suffering as optional. As I've said before, the degree of our suffering is based on the degree of our attachment. The change is difficult for those who cling and are attached to certain beliefs and situations or outcomes. And we all want to be happy. No one wants to suffer. Unfortunately, because of our lack of wisdom, uh, in these matters, uh, we seem to just chase after those things that create more suffering for ourselves and disregard those things that can bring true, lasting happiness and peace of mind. My reason for entering retreat at age 50 uh, was my deep longing to realize the truth of this life and to understand directly the experience, the nature of my mind, unfabricated and uncontrived. So with perseverance and determination, I did complete the retreat, as you know, and the significance, power, and influence of this uh, training had on me personally changed uh, the direction of my life significantly and uh, has been an endless source of uh, contemplation and study and practice. The practices done in retreat are uh, designed to be transformative. The training has been part of the Karmakagya tradition for centuries, and the practice of retreat was made popular by the great remake uh, master, Jankan Kantro, and Jomyang Kinsei Wongpa. The uh, tradition originated from the Buddha and is found in the teachings of the Kala Chakra Tantra um, concerning the cycles of time and uh, the cultivation of inner energy. The uh, cosmology 
that the Buddha taught is very complex, um, as it is found in the Kala Chakra, the Wheel of, the Wheel of Time. And uh, for those of you who want to pursue that more, uh, you can find, um, I refer you to the Treasury of Knowledge. It is, uh, there are a, a series of texts written by uh, a John Gan Kantra and translated by the Kala Rinpoche Translation Group. But uh, this particular uh, book is entitled uh, Myriad Worlds. And uh, it does give reference uh, to the Kala Chakra and uh, the uh, cosmology of um, what the Buddha taught. Again, any questions so far? So just a little history to underscore the importance of an unbroken lineage. We're talking about lineage, we're talking about Buddhism um, uh, from teaching from master to student. The four major schools, as most of you are familiar with, are the Kagyu, uh, the Nigma, the Gelug, and Shakya. The Kagyu uh, school traces this lineage from the primordial uh, Buddha Vajradhara to the Indian Mahasiddha Talopa to his student Naropa. And we have gone over um, much of those, uh, the lives Naropa, we're doing uh, none, and uh, in our Mahmudra lineage prayer, we also explored some of the, the lives of these Mahasiddhas and the lives of the great lineage masters are remarkable and inspirational and include uh, many of the teachings and meditations that are found and practiced, uh, done in retreat, which a good portion is uh, from. Uh, Naropa, the practice of the six yogas of Naropa. Other masters of the lineage include uh, uh, the student of Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa, Kampopa, and the first Karmapa, Dusan Chempa. We say this, um, you know, we, we identify them in the Mahmudra lineage prayer that we recite every day, and we will recite um, in just uh, a little bit again. But uh, to give credit uh, to our lineage teachers, each of these masters were taught by their teachers and continue our Mahamudra lineage uh, to the current Karmapa, the head of the Kagyu lineage known as Karmapa, Borchen Trinley Dorje, is the 17th uh, reincarnation, as you know, and we're going to celebrate his uh, birthday, June 26th, uh, just coming up shortly. He was born in 1985. Um, so he's 35 or 36. It depends, uh, consider uh, conception um, as the first year of life. Um, you know, the first nine months is also, is, you're not one, you're, you're basically one when you come out of the womb. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure how our Kamapa is uh, identifying that. Uh, but I, he's either 35 or 36, I believe. So um, we've celebrated 900 years of Kamapas. And as you know, beings identified as Karmapa, uh, reincarnations are Tukus. Uh, they are reincarnated uh, beings and have the title Rinpoche or Precious Teacher. There have been many recognized uh, Tukus in the Tibetan Buddhist uh, tradition. The first uh, Karmapa, Dusan Chempa, was the first Tuku um, to be recognized as Karmapa 900 years ago and has remained the spiritual head. Uh, the 16th Karmapa, a Tibetan, uh, was uh, one of the first to come to the United States to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha. And he sent many teachers uh, to the West to teach the Dharma. And one of those was Kempo Karta Rinpoche. The 16th Karmapa died in uh, Chicago in 1981. There's now a large stupa that is commemorating his, uh, his passage there. And the current Karmapa was discovered several years later a child of a nomadic family in Tibet. And like his predecessors, you know, he left a letter uh, with his senior student describing the names um, of his parents, um, names of the place of his birth, where he could be found, uh, as I say, his parents, and all the details uh, to make uh, the search party able to find and identify him. This was uh, true for each of the Karmapas. And much can be learned by reading about the lives of these masters. 
Um, it's called Anantar. This is a spiritual biography, and uh, you can read about uh, the 17 or 16 Karmapas, but I will leave it to the reader or to you to uh, continue to explore that further if so inclined. But as I say, it is inspirational and enlightening to read the lives of these masters. So I owe my teacher, uh, Kimbo Carter Rinpoche, an enormous debt of gratitude that I can never repay. The best I can do is to live up to his expectations of how a retreat lama should conduct him or herself for the benefit of all beings. Rinpoche was the quintessential role model for me on how to be a compassionate guide to suffering beings. And as you know, Rinpoche passed away October 6, 2019, at the age of 96 years of age. And he continued to teach regularly and give empowerments and fulfill his duties as abbot of KTD, a monastery in Woodstock, New York, until the, the time of his death. And Rinpoche would give all credit uh, to the Karmapa for all the things that he accomplished, uh, he would say was the blessing of Karmapa. So again, just a little bit about that uh, lineage tradition. And, uh, uh, again, Rinpoche was born in um, Tibet in 1924 and uh, was one of the greatest living masters of uh, recent history. He received his training uh, in, uh, in Tibet before the Chinese invasion and was highly accomplished in meditation, philosophy, and monastic arts. He served as abbot of uh, uh, Triana Dharma Chakra, KTD Monastery in Woodstock, New York, and was the spiritual guide of, uh, we have now about 35 um, KTCs, Kamatex uh, and Sholing, of which we are one, uh, affiliate centers, and was also in charge of the uh, Carmeling Retreat Center in Delhi, New York, which I was part of. And train thousands of students around the world. The uh, three-year retreat is part of the Kagyu tradition. Not all of the Tibetan um, lineages have a three-year retreat as part of their uh, training curriculum. But uh, this, these events, uh, uh, techniques, as you know, take place in an isolated uh, location. A group of practitioners are in retreat together under a qualified master. And uh, in my retreat, there were seven men. Some of you may have seen that picture of uh, us uh, during uh, in Rinpoche. There were seven um, people doing retreat together. And Rinpoche as our uh, retreat master. And that was during the picture that uh, you may have seen um, was during the Vajra Yukini practice. And during that uh, time for about nine months, you don't shave your, it is uh, just part of the practice along with other things. So we were looking like wild yogis. And the typical day begins about 4 a.m. and um, goes uh, to about 9 p.m., seven days a week, no vacations, no holidays or time off. While the schedule remains approximately the same throughout the retreat, the uh, actual meditation practices do change through the different stages. But uh, what is clear to me in retrospect at the end of the retreat is how short a time three years really is. Um, it sounds like a long time, and in some ways it is, but uh, for study and practice, uh, such deep inquiry into the mind, it is um, it goes by rapidly. Far from seeing the retreat as an experience ending in enlightenment uh, for me, um, I see it as a firm foundation on which I could go on, build ongoing practice in everyday life. There is the picture. <laughs> for those of you who uh, did not see it, uh, there I am being circled there on the bottom left next to Lama Karma, and Rinpoche is in the in the center. That was quite a motley crew, but uh, Rinpoche says it was one of the best retreats that he had, and I'm happy to have been part of it. 
Uh, yeah. Thank you for putting that up, I think. So what are the actual uh, teachings? And that's the, the, really the basics uh, of uh, what we're practicing. And there are um, different aspects of the teachings I mentioned. Uh, the uh, six yogas in Europa. But uh, we'll uh, just speak a little bit about shamatha and the vipassana, shamatha tranquility meditation and uh, shamatha insight meditation. As I mentioned uh, previously, the Buddhist teaching consists of cultivating virtue, avoid harm, and uh, taming the mind. Uh, so this is the uh, taming the mind uh, portion, meditation. And the first instruction that the uh, Buddha gave is to sit comfortably, settle yourself on a comfortable uh, seat, cushion, in a safe and quiet place where you are not uh, leaning uh, left or right or too far forward or backward. Uh, you can sit uh, on a meditation uh, cushion called the Zafu, those little round meditation cushions that you see. Um, you can even uh, sit on a chair uh, towards the edge of this chair if you're sitting on a chair so you're not leaning back and your feet are firmly placed on the floor, flat on the floor. And your uh, feet are about shoulder uh, width apart. Then uh, bring your uh, body into the position of uprightness and feeling uh, straightness. I often use the image of, uh, like we use in Tai Chi, feeling as if you're being suspended from the heavens by a string, so that you're not uh, slumping forward, but you're being as if pulled up uh, by a string. So after having taken your seat, you know, you, you place your legs, if possible, in the Vajra, or full lotus position. This is not easy and not everyone can do that. So it's, uh, if you're used to it, fine. And you can practice uh, doing that and approach it over time. The regular cross-legged position is fine. Or sattva position is suitable. It's with one half lotus. This uh, half lotus or full lotus is uh, called the uh, positions of indestructibility in the sense that the being stabilized or grounded. It does make a difference um, in your experience. Generally speaking, uh, men sit with their right leg on top or extended, and women with their left leg on top or extended if sitting cross-legged. But um, that's not essential. That is the first teaching. The back um, is straight straight as possible, like an arrow. The second position is not always talked about, uh, but it's called drawing up. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when sitting in the cross-legged position, you adjust your position of the body and uh, uh, bring in, uh, tighten the buttocks as if you're doing a, uh, a Kegel exercise, you know, close and tighten the sphincter muscles. And with a little effort, without breathing, just pull up the abdomen and the organs upward very gently and slowly relax everything back down to normal. This position contributes uh, to our health and toward maintaining vitality and warmth. When you're cold, you can do this uh, kind of position of closing the anal sphincter and uh, doing like a Kegel exercise. We lose a lot of heat through that uh, uh, lower So uh, strengthening of that uh, is also helpful. The third position is uh, to touch the uh, tip of the thumb on each hand uh, to the second joint, uh, ring finger, first, uh, the first or second joint and then relax the, uh, the fist down on the knees, palms downward on the knees. This is the position that Kemba Kartar uh, Rinpoche taught. Continue to keep your back straight and your knees uh, on the ground as much as possible. 
uh, if you need support for your knees, if they don't uh, make contact with the floor, you can put pillows underneath so that it doesn't strain your back. Or you can uh, just apply a little bit more uh, pressure on your knees by strengthening uh, or straightening uh, the arms a little bit. This will keep the structure uh, of the bones straight. The fourth position, uh, you may notice that even when your arms are straight, there is still a possibility that your back is curved or you're slouching. Uh, this can be <clears throat> from your hands extending over your knees. So uh, be mindful of your posture and make micro adjustments uh, in your sitting so that you feel, you know, not uh, uncomfortable, but uh, straight. So this is all part of mindfulness of uh, your meditation posture, and uh, it helps to engage the mind. It brings a quality of awareness and mindfulness uh, to, the, uh, to the practice in general, uh, maintaining that uh, erect channel. We're gonna be talking about the uh, uh, conception vessel, governor vessel, these uh, channels in the spine that uh, are sometimes blocked, and uh, the straightness uh, helps to move the chi and the blood in that way as well. So it has uh, a number of functions, but uh, to uh, enhance your awareness, um, that straightness is important. And periodically as well, you check your straightness uh, and do the micro adjustments necessary to stay straight and upright you can do an internal body scan so that you're aware of what's going on outside. We're not cutting off our awareness. We're enhancing our awareness. So we're aware of sounds, uh, sensations, uh, things in our environment. We're aware of our internal environment as well. That if we begin to uh, uh, lose our straightness, we begin to get uh, torpor or uh, tired and we, the body begins to collapse, uh, we're aware of that and we, again, uh, straighten it. We will also be doing walking meditation, which is a nice complement uh, to the sitting practice and can enhance and wake you up a little bit. And movement, uh, then you come back and sit again and your um, mind can be improved with greater clarity. So the fifth position is the neck and eyes. Uh, as I say, you're gonna keep the uh, neck, uh, bring the chin in slightly to straighten up the upper cervical vertebrae. And the eyes are um, looking, they can either look down at a 45 degree angle, about uh, a forearm's uh, length, it's called a cubit, and in the text uh, it says one cubit in front. So the eyes, uh, if we lower the gaze, it relaxes an overactive mind, and usually our minds are overactive overly stimulated. And so that's why we generally begin with the eyes uh, cast down about a 45 degree angle and about four arms length in front of us, looking at an imaginary spot. You know, um, the eyes again are unfocused. We're not looking at anything. Or we can, uh, if we become um, uh, tired or fatigued, we can raise the gaze a little bit and that will bring our energy up. The uh, position of the sixth position is having the tongue uh, flat against the uh, upper palate. This has a long term benefit of uh, creating the saliva from uh, you wanting to swallow um, frequently. And uh, so we have the tongue pressed against, gently touching the upper palate. And again, it uh, keeps us from being disturbed by having to swallow.
So I, I mentioned the, uh, the fifth position being the uh, uh, neck and eyes. Um, uh, so the, that's really the, the uh, fifth position. It has to do more with the eyes being gently opened. Um, and the, uh, the seventh position is uh, related uh, to the upper cervical vertebrae, keeping the, the chin slightly lifted. Don't strain. These are the seven positions. Uh, to be considered because uh, one is not accustomed to these different positions. Um, we want to uh, just practice uh, uh, doing them, be cognizant, be aware of your body's uh, posture. You may not uh, do them immediately for those of you who are beginning uh, the sitting practice. Again, many of you are uh, well trained and well practiced uh, in doing this, but um, be gentle with yourself, but firm. You know, I often uh, say it's like training a puppy. And we'll talk more about training that puppy when we talk about shamatha. So we keep these uh, <clears throat> seven positions in mind and uh, training uh, properly uh, is important <clears throat> right from the beginning so we don't get into bad habits with our posture. So it may not be so easy and comfortable, um, but uh, in the long run, it'll definitely be worthwhile. Okay, any questions about the posture? We want to I have be a question, Lama. Yes. Did you say you wanted to be a starship captain? <laughs> yes, uh, my alter ego is uh, John Luke Picard. Oh, I thought, I thought so. I think Yes. So, so Lama, would you re reiterate, um, okay, in the sitting position, uh, you're pressing down from the abdomen, is that correct? Or what, what do you do with that? Oh, yeah, if you're closing that lower sphincter, you're actually pulling up uh, on the organs. Is that the one you mean? Yeah. That's yes. right. uh, so <clears throat> we're closing that lower gate, um, as if doing a Kegel exercise, uh, closing the anal sphincter, pulling up. Uh, gently on the organs, and then releasing and relaxing. Oh, okay. All right, great. Thank yeah, you. thanks for that clarity. If it was unclear, um, yes, you're not pushing down. You're pulling up. And then, but then releasing. And then releasing and relaxing, yes. Okay. Lama? Yes. Lama? Yes, Nancy? I have a question. I, I know I've been doing meditation for a while, but my cushion, how tall should that cushion be? You want really? Four finger. You want to be seated about four uh, fingers um, or a, a hand span um, high. So it should be. You want your knees lower than your hips. So it it should be uh, uh, relatively like that, about a hand span. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions about the, uh, the seated posture? <clears throat> that is our, uh, our foundation, so it's important that it be correct. Okay, um, <clears throat> well, well, we'll start with uh, the shamatha and the Vipassana meditation. You can see that uh, there's we don't always talk in detail about these things, and it's uh, easy for us to get into bad habits. So I just want to reiterate um, and uh, confirm the, the posture. And if there's any question about it, we can uh, uh, answer those questions as we just did. If there's any other questions, you let me know. But this is uh, the first area that we want to cultivate is meditation. We want to wake up uh, from our dreamlike sleepwalking that we've been doing since beginning this time. And uh, one of the ways we begin to do that is with shamatha meditation. And as you know, um, the Sanskrit word, that's a, the shamatha is a Sanskrit word, uh, generally translated as uh, tranquility. Shane is uh, the Tibetan word referring to this type of meditation. So you may see it as a tranquility meditation, that's generally what we call it in English. But uh, you'll see it as shamatha or shanae as well. 
referring to this type of meditation. So meditation, as we say, is key to uh, the Buddhist teaching. And uh, the form of meditation um, that the Buddha taught to establish basic tranquility and calmness of mind is this is uh, the essential progress. We have to tame our mind. We have to get to some level of workability for our mind to make it stable. And this is the purpose of shamatha, or tra tranquility meditation. And through calming the mind, we can experience uh, a state of peace and tranquility. This is necessary prerequisite leading to mindfulness and insight and what will follow. But first, we have to train it. So I think for most of you, as you practice this, you find that uh, this one deepens the meditative experience of shamatha. The mind does grow um, calm and patient, and we're able to see more clearly. But this does not happen without effort. Um, I ran across a, a quote recently. Um, Anissa Nin, uh, I'm not really uh, familiar with her work, but uh, she says we don't see things uh, as they are. We see them as we are. And uh, I think that's very true. Um, so we, are, we want to see clearly, not projections of our own uh, habitual patterns and our hopes and fears. In that way, uh, happiness uh, becomes a choice. We don't have to uh, suffer. Well, uh, we may need to uh, stop there and we will go into uh, greater detail, detail on the uh, uh, shamatha and the pasana. And this is where I usually talk about the analogy uh, of training a puppy. So that when we're sitting and we want the mind to stay, and the puppy doesn't listen, um, our mind is uh, just like that. It tends to run off in projecting a, a, in uh, the future or reflecting on the past. We tend to be time travelers. Rarely are we in this moment seeing clearly. So we will talk more about uh, training our puppy mind. and. Uh, doing it over and over again until um, it behaves. Any final questions or comments? So as we do practice this, just like when we're training our puppy, uh, we don't get mad um, with the puppy. That just uh, uh, creates the circumstances for, for the runaway or uh, to create a negative experience for us ourselves too. Um, we begin uh, taming our mind with patience, but with perseverance. So um, in the beginning, uh, for those of you who may just be starting, there's, uh, we often uh, say 21 breaths, 21 days, just following the breath. When inhaling, be aware of inhaling. When exhaling, be aware of exhaling. And we count the exhale. One. Inhaling, exhaling through. And just be with the breath. Uh, it's like uh, we're uh, training the mind. It's like uh, when we go to the gym, you know, we're, we're creating a mental muscle here to create the uh, auspicious circumstances to see the nature of our mind clearly without distraction and without interference and uh, obstacles. Our minds are so easily distracted, and that is the uh, main problem that we have in meditation, is distraction.